Let's begin. And Mr. Kusha. Ooh, this is a big one. Mr. Kusha. Okay. Well, let's play, let's play, let's play a serious opening. I think Mr. Kusha might be streaming, so cool pairing. And we are facing a Karo Khan. So Mr. Kusha is a very, very strong player. So we are going to play. You know, I'm gonna play my real stuff. I'm going to play a fantasy variation, which is what I have. I think I've already played it in, in the speed run. We're gonna play a fantasy. Okay, and, and Mr. Kusha responds with one of the most reputable lines against the fantasy, the e5 variation. The point is that d takes e5 runs into queen h4 check. So in this position, it is important to proceed with knight f3. This is theory. And bishop g4. Yeah, so this is the recommendation in, I think, quite a few books, this bishop g4 variation. And it's incredibly solid. So white has many different ways of reacting to uh, to this variation i'm a little bit rusty on the theory but as far as i remember the move in this position yeah so bishop c4 bishop c4 is a move and it's actually i think the main move uh threatening bishop takes f7 and knight takes e5 so after bishop c4 i think black goes knight d7 in order to cover the e5 square then white castles, black goes knight gf6, and I'm sure Mr. Kusha knows this theory uh, backwards and forwards. But there was a different move that I had analyzed here, which if memory serves me right, is c3. And I'm gonna try to remember, is it c3 in this position? What worries me about c3 is actually that black can grab the pawn. Bishop takes f3, queen takes f3, and e takes d4. And I'm hunting for the compensation. You know what? Let's play bishop c4. Let's let's stick to what I know is fine. Okay, knight d7. I'm I'm definitely out of my league here theory wise. All right, now I think we should probably castle and keep developing. Let's see what Kusha comes up with here. Knight g f6. Okay, so this is the line. And now the point is, if white plays d5, then black responds with bishop takes f3 and recaptures the pawn on e5. So what we should do here is support the d4 pawn because black is constantly sort of threatening he takes d4. So as far as I know, the move is c3. So far, I'm pretty confident. Okay, but Kusha knows this line clearly very, very well. We're gonna try to take black out of theory here because uh, this this will not be an interesting game if you know I just get caught in, in, in crazy deep preparation. So let's think what can we do here well we can play bishop g5 we can play bishop g5 and then knight bd2 or we can play knight bd2 immediately the drawback of playing knight bd2 is that it blocks the bishop on c1 i'm leaning toward developing the bishop first and then playing knight bd2 we can also play a move we can also play the move queen to e1 in order to get the queen out of the pin so that our knight has more mobility. I quite like the look of queen e1, actually. It's a pretty flexible move. It solidifies the center. It takes the sting out of e takes d4. Hopefully we can get our opponent out of theory with this move. I mean, if Mr. Kushu responds instantly, then he's the foremost Karokan expert in the world. Okay, it looks like we finally gotten our opponent to think. By the way, those watching on YouTube, Mr. Kusha is a frequent guest of the stream. Uh, he's a streamer himself, as you can see by his account name, and he might be streaming this very game. So queen one is a very logical appearing move to me because why is it important to unpin the knight? Well, because if black develops the dark squared bishop to d6, one typical idea in such positions is knight h4 and knight f5, and maybe the queen later on can swing to g3. So the fantasy variation is an attacking line, it's a tactical weapon, and we want to play it in the spirit of the line. We want to go for attack on the king's side. Oh, he's not streaming, okay. And this is gonna be a very serious game. Kusha's a very, very strong player and um, we're gonna to try to play you know, our, our very best. I, I didn't like queen b3 because it didn't really create a threat. Remember that f7 is protected by black's bishop. So queen b3 I thought might just run into b5. And here, if black plays b5, we have the b3 square for the bishop. But it's very important to keep this bishop on this diagonal in order to pressure 
the f7 pawn which currently is well defended but later on could become a weakness uh, also knight takes e4 fails for tactical reasons which i'll show after the game yeah i was aware that the pawn on e4 was hanging and uh it certainly could not have been captured i am expecting what am i expecting i i'm expecting bishop f8 to d6 maybe he's thinking about bishop e7 a more modest developing move Ooh, i don't know yeah queen e1 is a, i actually really like queen e1 i think it's a it's a it's a dangerous move bishop takes f3 okay so that's a big move that's a big move um kusha gets rid of our knight in return he's he gets rid of a very important piece as far as i know the light squared bishop in such positions uh is an integral defender because without it f7 becomes pretty weak and our bishop is now uncontested it's happy how are we going to recapture so this is actually not a given most of you are probably thinking well obviously rook takes f3 but there is a case to be made in similar positions for the move gf why because well there's two things gf solidifies the e4 pawn it opens the g file so we have this idea and it potentially prepares to knock the e5 pawn out of its off the board with f3 f4 so given that black hasn't completed his kingside development gf is a serious alternative but i'm not in an overly adventurous mood right now so i am more in the mood for rook takes f3 i'm more in the mood for the conventional rook takes f3 bishop d6 okay well the thing is kusha pre-moves bishop d6 so gf would have actually been like basically winning because bishop d6 f4 and we fork him with e5 but that's not how we want to win the game that's not how we want to win uh, with a dirty you know pre-move trick bishop d6 okay so let's continue pondering how we want to accumulate our pieces on the king side a couple of candidate moves come to mind so the obvious move is bishop g5 just developing the bishop okay that's fine but we're not really attacking the knight because the two knights are defending each other the other move that comes to mind is queen to h4, just bringing the queen to the king side and preparing, uh, preparing to attack in case Black Castle's king side, which I think he will. Okay, we don't want to go knight d2. I, I don't want to obstruct the bishop. The what worries me about bishop g5 is that Black has this annoying move queen b6, hitting d4 and hitting b2 at the same time. So perhaps a more flexible move is needed. Although after queen h4, there's still queen b6. Queen b6 is just a generally very annoying threat. Queen b6 is a very annoying threat. So let's think. Bishop g5, queen b6. Let's see if we can spot a response to that move. Yeah, queen f2 maybe. But then, ah, oh, queen f2 maybe actually, yeah. Ooh, that looks good. That does look good. Bishop g5, queen b6, queen f2... And if knight takes e4, then we can snap off the f7 pawn, and the king is in huge trouble there. Okay, I'm sold. Let's go bishop g5. I mean, this is a little bit flimsy. The way we're playing this is flimsy, but it's it's the fantasy variation. What do you expect? It, it is also potentially very rewarding, because we have the center. If we manage to complete our development successfully, we're going to be better, no question about it. But we run the risk of our center collapsing. And if our center collapses, we'll be in huge trouble. If we lose the d4 pawn, Black's knight is going to jump into this juicy e5 square, and we're going to be dead. So very important to be accurate here with white. I will be honest, I'm regretting. I'm regretting not playing gf. I think gf was better, actually. I think gf might have been better. But we'll roll with it. Bishop g5 is on the board. Too late now. All right. So what am I expecting here? I'm expecting either castle's kingside or queen b6. There's probably other moves. Black could throw in h6. We're just going to play bishop h4. I don't really know who this benefits at this point. The next move, of course, is knight b1 to d2. We want to complete our development. It would also be kind of nice if we could throw in the move king h1 so that in case black does play queen b6, we don't have the additional worry of the pawn on d4 being pinned, we have a little bit more flexibility in that case. But yeah, Kusha is probably deciding between these, these moves. It's a pretty simple position to understand. Like, it's, it's clear what the battle is revolving around here. There's no mystery as to, like, what we're playing for. I'm playing to complete the development and 
start the king side attack once black castles and kusha is trying to hit me where it hurts while i haven't completed while i haven't yet completed the development now the question who's going whose strategy is going to prevail we'll see might very well be his yeah it's an interesting interesting position definitely will be a lot to analyze after the game queen c7 okay queen c7 i did not expect but it's also a very reasonable move and maybe he wants to castle queenside that is not something i've given enough attention to castles queenside okay so why don't we just play knight d2 well what we have to reckon with is e takes c takes and bishop takes h2 check but i think that's a worthy pawn to sacrifice because e takes d4 is a massive concession it gives us a juicy center i'm more than willing to part ways with a corner pawn if that means we get full control of the center so i think knight d2 is essentially a no-brainer rook f8 okay so definitely he's telegraphing that he's preparing castle's queen side yeah the point of rook f8 is to defend f7 so let's think how are we going to try to deter or we can't deter castle's queen side there's no way to prevent it but we can probably prepare for it okay i have an interesting idea this is an idea that combines tactics and positional play so as i've already said our main worry is the center right we need to keep our center under control at all costs so I have this idea of playing bishop c4 to d3. And I know this is a move most of you will be like, eh, really? You know, didn't I just say the bishop is crucial to keep on this diagonal? Well, the circumstances have changed. Now f7 is no longer a weakness, especially since black is going to castle queenside. And I think it's more important for us to make sure that the center is well protected. But there's another idea. We're going to make this move because our time is ticking. That I think it's more important for the knight to have the c4 square than it is for the bishop. I think knight d2 to c4 is going to come with greater effect if black castles queenside than keeping the bishop on c4. And it's also a very solid move because what am I anticipating? I am anticipating him putting a rook on e8 after he castles queenside. And so our pawn on e4 is going to be nicely protected in that case, leaving the knight free to pursue a more active agenda on c4. What is it doing on c4? Well, it's obviously pressuring the bishop and the e5 pawn. And I absolutely will take that bishop to give us two bishops against two knights if he allows it. Yeah, of course, I'm not excluding the possibility of a pawn storm. But pawn storms are slow and cumbersome. They're generally overrated. And it's not like if we get a pawn to a6, it's checkmate. You know, people have a hard time understanding that. Pawn storms are very cumbersome devices it usually takes three moves to get your pawn to where it wants to be and then it's not like it's made you actually just provoke weaknesses then you actually have to mount the attack i've talked about this before when there's an opposite side castling situation a lot of people just sort of indiscriminately go all right it's time to go b4 and a4 and b5 that's not the only way to approach opposite side castling positions you can also play with your pieces that's not forbidden and that's what we're doing here knight d2 to c4 notice that we're still sacrificing the h2 pawn if he wants he can still play ed bishop h2 but nothing has changed we will still have a monster center and black will have logistical problems getting the bishop back out of h2 as i'll show you after the game so the caveman attack has a time and place am i saying you know you never pawn storm absolutely not pawn storms are great but not in every circumstance rook d a great move kusha playing extremely well as expected let's think i'm just gonna think in silence here for a bit i think i know what i want to play but i'm confirming okay i'm gonna make the move queen g3 and everybody should understand the intention of this move um the intention of this move is to prevent e takes d4 now you say wait, wait a second didn't i just say that i want to encourage e takes d4 well again this is a very dynamic position. What does it mean for a position to be dynamic? It means a lot of things change on every move. I think that's a good definition of dynamic. That means stuff that was true in the previous move is no longer true. Things that weren't a threat are now a threat. I'm now a lot more worried about e takes d4 because this is an x-ray against my queen. You can already probably spot knight takes c4 and f5 related ideas. So now e takes d4 is a bigger enemy and so queen g3 gets the queen onto a good square and it prevents ed4 because knight takes d6 wins the bishop with check if black plays knight h5 which probably worries some of you it's not something to be worried about the queen can tuck itself away on h3 
And h3 is a great square. It's out of the way of the other pieces, and it's x-raying the knight on d7. And uh, I, I like the way that I've arranged my pieces here. I think we're starting... Maybe I'm going to jinx it, but I think I'm starting to get control over this game. Uh, but there's a ton of work yet to be done. Both of us are taking quite a long time, so this might actually come down to a time scramble. No, I think, I think at this point white is definitely better. But black is incredibly solid. That is the Karakhan, after all. Okay, rook e6. I am aware that it's a move, but rook e6, we can take the bishop. Rook e6, remember that we can also take the bishop. It's like jumping off at the last moment, right? We can take the bishop when we want to take it. Yeah, very tight. And notice the work that's being done by the bishop on d3. It's a purely defensive piece. Defensive pieces are underrated. Right? And that's why I put it there, so that it defends the pawn on e4. You don't have to worry about it. And I g8. Okay. So I guess Kusha wants the move f6, or maybe even f5. Hmm. Interesting. I'm going to take another couple of moments in silence here to think. This is very complicated even for me. I'm not hiding that. So this, the, the, the tempting move to me is rook af1, but that kind of runs into f6. That kind of runs into f6. So maybe we don't... I mean, black can play f6 anyway, but maybe we don't want to provoke it. Maybe we want to drop the bishop away from g5. How about that idea? Bishop e3. Ah, I like bishop e3 a lot. Why do I like bishop e3 a lot? Because again, it solidifies the center and it attacks the pawn on g7. I like the look of bishop e3. I think the bishop has done its job on g5. It's now time to adopt a more defensive posture. Now the pawn on g7 is hanging. That's our first threat. And g6 is a pretty significant weakness that perhaps later on we can try to exploit. Looks like black's position is just starting to show some cracks, but we have to figure out a way to exploit those cracks. Now, f5 is not a threat. We can take the bishop, but I don't think there's any hurry. Maybe there is a hurry. Maybe if we don't take it, the bishop will drop back to e7, and I'll regret it. So one idea that I have is to play rook a f1, induce the move f6, then take the bishop, and then reposition the bishop back to c4, or move the queen away to h3. Or start pushing the pawns and launch the pawn storm. Hmm. a4 even here is pretty tempting, by the way. Just pushing the pawn, creating, you know, grabbing space on the queen side. All right, my gut is telling me what is... I, my gut isn't actually telling me anything. <laughs> Okay, let's go rook f1. Let's start by doubling. We have to also speed up a little bit. Gusha is a very fast player. Okay, I have an idea to play queen h3 and x-ray the knight. How about that? Let's go queen h3. Attacking h7 and x-raying the knight. Why is it good to x-ray the knight? Well, what is the knight doing? Well, one of the things the knight's doing is it's protecting e5 and it's protecting f6. So queen h3 puts more strain on those pawns. And that may lead us to an unexpected tactic, right? When you're putting a lot of strain on your opponent's position, that's what creates the preconditions for a sudden tactic that might seemingly come out of nowhere, but it doesn't actually come out of nowhere. It's just because you've been pressuring and pressuring and eventually something's got to give. Why not queen h3 before rook f1? I mean, it was possible, actually. Maybe it was even better to play queen h3 first. But I wanted to induce another weakness. I wanted the pawn to sit on f6, which restricts the mobility of the knight on g8. Maybe the immediate queen h3 was, in fact, better. I don't know. It's hard to say. Am I worried about black pawn storming? Not particularly. There's not too much that I'm worried about in this position. I think we're super neat and tidy. And I don't see... Any danger to my own king. Okay, we're also getting Kusha to think, which is good. The time is ticking down for both of us. And we're only 18 moves in. Yeah, I'm regretting a little bit. Well, no, rook af1, I think, cannot be such a bad move. I mean, after all, we're bringing the rook into the game. All of our pieces are doing something. Which basically means, yeah, we can't really be worse here. Yeah, everything's going on on the center and the king. So the queen side is a dead zone right now. Rook e7, okay. I think that's a tactical blunder, ladies and gentlemen. I think I think Kusha has just given us a chance to win material. Now, I mentioned previously that we're X-raying the knight on d7. Well, what move becomes uh, more serious 
now that we're doing that? Well, the move D takes E5, which previously just allowed black to occupy the outpost, now needs to be considered. So we are going to play D takes E5. Knight E5 is illegal. F takes E5 loses the rook on F8, hence the reason we doubled. And Bishop takes E5, what do I notice? I notice that there is an alignment of the two rooks. What does that tell us? Well, we should look for pins. Bishop c5, but that blunders the bishop. No, it doesn't, because the knight on d7 is pinned. We are going to play bishop c5. Now there's a, yeah, bishop h2. I saw that move. And of course we play king h1. Of course we play king h1. We don't take on h2, because then black takes and takes c5. I did see that move. And this game is also not over. This game is far from over. I think we're technically winning after this. But black still has a very solid position, so we still need to demonstrate some good technique. Bishop e5. Now, okay. So we have several ways to approach this. We have several ways to approach this. I'm trying to find a knockout blow. I'm trying to find a win. So we could take here, and then the queen takes. Let's take the rook. Let's take the rook. We could take this pawn, but then I'm really worried about a pin down the h-file. The other candidate move is to take on e5, induce, queen takes e5, and then shift the rook over to d1 in order to mount pressure on the knight on d7. I'm also very tempted by the look of queen to e6. I mean, look at how sexy that move looks. Queen e6, are you kidding me? Sticking the queen right into black's grill. Doesn't that look good? Let's go queen e6. I'm just playing. This is a purely intuitive move. I did zero calculation, full disclosure. It just like, it's just begging to be played. I mean, it just like puts so much additional strain on black's position and it, it just keeps the initiative going. How does the CM blunder so easily? Well, I don't think that was an obvious blunder at all. I think he reacted very well to it. And this has been an incredibly complicated game handled very well by our opponent. So let's relax. So rook f6 almost works. Rook f6 almost works. Knight e5, queen e5 I don't want. Queen f7, queen d8. Wow. Hmm, let me think. Rook f6, bishop f6, knight d6, king d8. We have a draw. Obviously, I don't want a draw. We want to win. Oh! Oh my gosh, I see something really cool, but does it work? Oh man, this if this works, this is going to be really pretty. I don't know if it works, though. It's got to work. I'm thinking about something really, really pretty. Let me just calculate. Yeah, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to go for it. Rook takes f6. You guys are all seeing it, so I won't even introduce it. Rook f6. Yeah, but it's not as easy. I know most of you think this is easily winning, but it's actually not. And I'm pretty sure we're going to follow the the best. He's going to find all the best moves, because there's not really not much of a choice for black. So I'm still thinking about how to win in the critical position. It looks completely winning, but it's somehow black is surviving there. I don't even understand how. Yeah, now knight d6, intermezzo, and rook takes f6. And rook takes f6. If knight f6, black gets checkmated. The problem is black has rook f8, and somehow black is holding on for dear life. Okay, I think I see the, no. Man, this is frustrating. Every time I think I see the win, some dumb defense pops up. Yeah, rook f8, knight f7, king e8. And again, black is surviving. Ah, but then maybe rook f3 simply. No, rook f8 and knight f7, then king e8. No, 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 no. Knight f7, king e8. I, I'm, I'm leaning toward knight f7, king e8, and rook f3. I think that's got to be winning. I think it's got to be the win. I mean, there's knight f7 you can play without any risk. Because if king c8, then queen takes c7, and we hit the rook. So knight f6 doesn't work. So king e8 is forced. Of course, black can also sack on f7, but then we're simply up a full exchange and we're mating. So now the idea is to play rook f3. This is a move that I'll have to explain in depth after the game. Basically, I'm trying to keep the tension, and I'm trying to keep the pressure on black's position fully alive. And I reserve the ability to play knight d6 whenever, whenever I want. So the knight on d7 is immobilized, because if it moves, then knight d6 leads to an instant loss. The rook on f8 will be lost. The knight on e7 is pinned. The rook on f8 has no prospect. So the only piece that can really move for black is the queen. 
The move I'm struggling to refute is queen b6, not because it does anything, but just because it is the only way to move. But in that position, we have time. And I think I can put my time to good use and activate the bishop, or I could just play b4 and restrict black even further. Oh, there's such a gorgeous line there. Oh, I see some cool stuff. Wait, let me think. Oh, so unfortunate that none of it quite seems to work. I think I see, okay, rook g8. It's not what I expected. Not what I expect. So knight d6 again, he goes there. We can repeat once if we wanted to. Knight d6, king d8, rook f7. Knight e5, rook e7, and mate! Wait, that's promising. He's got knight c5, ah. He's got knight c5. Okay, so maybe just b4. Maybe b4 to stop knight c5. I think b4 makes sense here. Rook g7. Hmm. Playing very quickly, which is disconcerting as I'm low on time. Okay, I'm tempted to play bishop c4, even though I don't know exactly why. e5 is also interesting. Yeah, e5 is very interesting. I think e5 might be the move. I don't know why exactly just yet. I just don't see a move for black here. Because knight f8 loses to knight d6. Yeah, I think e5. What does e5 do? I mean, e5 just like drives another pawn into the position and anchors. It anchors the d6 square so that after knight d6 check, our queen is free to roam about the cabin and produce tactical ideas. Like, for example, knight d6 check king d8 and rook f7 this post game analysis is going to be juicy so don't go anywhere um there's so much i have to explain so uh, my actual threat here is knight d6 check okay queen b6 now he plays it now he plays it okay now let me think this is i need to solve one last hurdle here knight d6 king d8 rook f7 takes takes let's think I think that's a win because he can't stop queen e8. If knight e5, queen e8, king c7, queen e7. So let's calculate. Knight d6, king d8, rook f7, takes, takes, knight moves. No, queen e8. If knight e5, queen e8, if queen e3, queen e8. Oh my god, queen e3, queen e8, queen c8, knight. No, it doesn't work. Oh my god, he has queen e3 there. Oh my gosh. He's holding on. I think bishop c4 might be the move. This is honestly, it's unreal to me that there's like no immediate win. I think there is, I'm just not seeing it. A5, yeah. Okay, I could take it. Play knight d6. Maybe a3, and we go for Zugzwang. All right, I'm going to take it. I'm going to take the pawn. Maybe I should have. I should have just gone queen d6. It was winning on the spot. Or rook d3. Oh, rook d3 was just winning. Oh no. Rook d3 was so easy. Ay ay ay. That's criminal that I didn't see that. Let's just check. Yeah. Okay. I guess rook f1. And rook d1. Maybe I can repeat the same idea. No, but rook. Huh. Okay. Let's go rook f1. This is simply phenomenal defense by Kusha. Just phenomenal. The way he's surviving this is crazy. But I think his time might be coming to an end if I can find like one more move. And I think that one more move is rook to d1. We switch to the d file. And the point is that if the knight moves, we mate on d8. This is not spectacular, but I think it's going to get the job done, which is more important in such positions. I think this is the final straw that broke the camel's back. I think this is this is over. I mean, he's been finding incredible resources. Yeah, King F8 is very resilient because now if we play Rook D7, if we play Rook D7, then there's Queen C1. But we play Queen D7. We don't give Black any checks down the back rank, and it's over. Oh, what a game. This was probably maybe top three in terms of most complicated games. Um... A lot to talk about, and a lot remain behind the scenes. That's the frustrating thing about these types of games is that a lot of the most beautiful lines remain behind the scenes. Yeah, it was winning. 
Okay, it was just completely winning, actually. It was like plus a million. Okay, GG, GG, Kusha. So this was a Karokan. We played into the fantasy variation. I don't really know whether I had business going into the fantasy without having reviewed it prior, but I was hoping that Kusha wouldn't go into this line, take stakes in E5. Now, we have mostly faced in Blitz and stuff the move E6. E6 is, I think, the most popular move these days, and it leads to uh, kind of a French-like structure, which is not to everybody's liking. The main line is knight c3, bishop b4, now very fashionable, is the move bishop d3, which is a pawn sack. Uh, it's a pawn sack, black can take and take on d4, but white gets, what does white get? White gets massive development and the f-file, which can be used when you castle short. So there's a lot of theory here that you could uh, dig around, and queen b6 is even a fashionable move as well. Of course, there's, there's g6, which is a solid line. Uh, but D takes E4 and E5 is incredibly principled. This is the most principled line. This is the most principled line. Yeah, Kusha, if you want to call and analyze, I'm totally fine with that. All right, sure. All right, so for those watching on YouTube, my opponent is going to be calling me. And we're going to be analyzing the game together. It's going to be fun. Hey. Hey, how's it going? Going well. Uh, thanks for... Thanks for thanks for calling. This is I think this will be a lot of fun. It will be a great honor for me and a great opportunity. Of course, don't don't mention it. This is this is great. So I was pretty rusty on this line after Bishop G four. I think this was the first like interesting moment. I was debating between C three and Bishop C four. Mm -hmm. What do you what do you know here? So I know that after C three, Bishop takes F three, Queen takes F three, takes D four. The lines are a little bit dangerous for Black, so this is not what I usually play. Uh, I actually mm. don't know that much. Like I think there's, I I'm looking at engine now. There's Bishop C four, so I, I was planning to play Knight D seven regardless against C three. Uh huh. Knight D seven. Yeah, that's sort of what I remembered. And now the Bishop can come out to E two. I think this is an alternate okay. alternate development. Yeah. And then knight f6, castles. Bishop, Bishop b6. Yeah, knight bd2. This is actually the line. Castles and knight c4. Interesting. And now... I wasn't that familiar with this line, honestly. I, I haven't faced it that much. Like, 90% of people who I play, they play bishop c4 after bishop g4. Uh-huh. Yeah, no, I, I, I knew it was the main line, but I didn't know much about it. So I was on my own after bishop c4. Mm -hmm. So knight d7, castles I think is pretty logical. Uh, this all seems pretty much forced. Knight f6 and c3. A lot of people were wondering why not knight takes c4 here. I'll just show that bishop takes f7 is totally crushing. And king takes f7, knight takes c5 is a double check. And the bishop on g4 is lost. So <laughs> you, weren't, you weren't tempted to take the pawn. Yeah, I actually want to show a line if you don't mind. So of course, I know I know there's a line with Bishop D6 where black uh, where, where white can actually win a pawn with Queen B3, castles Queen B7, but black gets some massive compensation. So if Bishop takes F3, sorry. Yeah, it's the analysis board is kind of janky, so I'm I'm making the moves on my end as well. Queen takes B7. Oh, and then like bishop takes f3 and i didn't recall the rest of the line like i haven't played it in a while but i remember that this is pretty good for black yeah i mean i think with the lack of development on the queen side i'm the engine is giving rook f3 ed cd and now knight g4 Ugh. yeah this is wow. not to my liking e5 there's going to be knight e5 and bishop c5 and queen is coming to d1 yeah this is this is game over yeah, I didn't remember the details, so I decided to go with a more solid bishop h5, which meets queen b3 with b5. Right. That, I, I was reasoning during the game. I thought that was the point. Queen b3, b5, and the bishop has to leave the diagonal, which is undesirable. So, originally, after bishop h5, my intention was bishop g5, but somehow I was very worried about queen b6 there. Like, this queen b6 idea is very annoying in these types of positions, I think. Yeah, sure. 
So I don't know what you would have done after bishop g5, but oh, bishop e7 I, I, I think is also fine. Yeah, usually like white can't take on e5 because always I'm going to take bishop f3, knight e5 and, and queen c7 castles. Pretty solid for black, I think. Mm -hmm. Agreed, agreed. So queen e1 I thought was more flexible. You took on f3, which I wasn't... Like necessary. I think bishop d6. Were you worried about knight h4 and like knight f5? Yeah, that's one of the things I was worried of. And also like some point, maybe some bishop g5. Like bishop mm -hmm. g5 combined with knight h4 puts a lot of pressure on f6, and f5 might be a weak square. So I was kind of worried about these kinds of setups. I I really didn't like to give up my light squared bishop, but these things worried me a lot. Yeah, I was I was actually going to play the immediate knight h4, and this looked very juicy, especially if you castle kingside. So I, I tend to agree. Like this position after knight h4 castle, I don't know if you can see my moves. Yeah, yeah, of course I can. Oh, okay, cool. It's just weirdly I I can't see yours, but okay. But this position I just thought is like, you know, super fun to play for white. Surely. <laughs> so I think bishop f3 was a pretty wise decision. Rook f3 and bishop d6. You're super solid here. Yeah. But again, the bishop on c4 is, is now a god. It was really annoying <laughs> to deal with it. <laughs> yeah, it's totally uncontested. And I, I, it didn't even occur to me that you could castle queenside until, honestly, until you played queen c7. So, like, I, I totally forgot about that concept. And I started to get worried about my center. I see. Uh, by the way, I forgot to mention something. You pre-moved bishop d6, but I actually was seriously considering gf. I didn't pre-move bishop d6. Okay, you just played quickly, but yeah, it's I, funny I, I because... Played... <laughs> I, yeah, yeah, I saw that. I was planning to go bishop e7 against gf3. Uh-huh. And if I yeah, go I... f4 anyway? Uh, this one, I, I think I... Yeah, that, that looks really bad. At least I'm not losing a piece right away with bishop right. e6. <laughs> yeah, but it's weird. This also looks annoying. So I'll just show everybody that this this loses because whichever pawn you take, the other, you know, the other pawn defends e5, and Black just ends up losing the game on the spot. Classic idea. Yeah, Bishop e7, f4 takes e5. I mean, at the very least, looks like a strong initiative. Or just Bishop takes f4. Yeah, Bishop f4 looks more annoying to me because it doesn't give me the d5 square. Uh huh. That's a fair point. Yeah, Bishop e7 here, here, and then Knight d2. The white's got to be better in this position with such a center. The reason I ultimately didn't play GF, I didn't mention this to my chat, but it was actually this move, knight h5. I didn't even think about knight h5, honestly. Uh-huh. I guess it's just f4 is so strong that I think stopping it at all costs is important. Mm-hmm. Sure. I'll, although, does this really stop f4? I'm not sure. But anyway, so is GF something to chew on? Uh, also, there was GF knight b6 and e takes d4, which I wasn't sure about. Yeah, this one, this one I did consider actually. This one, I, I, I was planning to think more after GF3. I wasn't planning to play quickly, but bishop e7 was my first intention. But knight b6 was something I saw as well. That it's a possibility. Yeah, maybe this just refutes GF because I think I have to move the bishop and then ED. And I'm not sold on white's compensation because if E5, then like, you, again, as you mentioned, black gets the D5 square. So I thought this I mean, was a little I bit too adventurous. You mean, yeah, I mean, actually after rook F3, you, you still have knight B6, but here I think it's a lot more dangerous after bishop B3, ED. I think E5 yeah, yeah, is yeah, just good for white. One... This one seemed seemed really sketchy to me. With the Agreed. rook on f2. Agreed. So bishop d6, bishop g5. Okay, so queen c7, knight d2. Like, I assume you didn't seriously think about taking h2? No, I never did because <laughs> the, the center is just crushing. e5 is coming. Yeah, I'll show this on the board just for the chat. Here, here, and actually the bishop has nowhere to go because e5 is coming next. So. Even if the bishop is not lost, I think this is crushing. Yeah, if seven's weak, the rook's X-ring. No, this is terrible. So rook f8 defends the pawn and prepares to castle. 
And here I thought for a while, like, I wasn't totally sure how to defend against the plan of castles in rookie eight. But I came up with this idea that I kind of liked, which is bishop d3 and knight c4. Yeah, and I think it was a really powerful idea. So I castled pretty quickly, but after knight c4, I was debating between bishop e7 and rook d8. Mm -hmm. But then after bishop e7, I felt like my control over the center is not going to be as powerful compared to rook d8. And I was worried that in some lines, like not right away, but in some lines you might take on e5 and use some pin with bishop f4 or something. So I felt like uh, rook d8 is is more solid. <laughs> I agree. I, also, I can just start like pushing, and if he takes d4, bishop f4 literally traps the queen. <laughs> traps the queen. Wow, crazy line. So here I feel like black is at a standstill while white is like starting to push. I think rook d8 is, is the best practical decision. Um, but it's already yeah. kind of unpleasant after queen g3. Yeah, I didn't came up with anything better than knight g8 because f7 pawn is backwards, and if you get rook f one then I can never, ever move that knight away. That's a good point. Um, yeah, that was I, the plan. I, yeah, if you give me time to go knight g8, f6, rook e7 without provoking more weaknesses, I think black is holding, but I just didn't have enough time after bishop e3. Yeah, I wanted. To, I wasn't sure where I was going with this, but I thought, okay, I'll provoke all these weaknesses, and queen h3 is an important move because it ties you down further, and now de becomes a big problem. Yeah, like here, I know I blundered like an exchange, but um, I don't see a way to, to, to save material. It's not so easy. Maybe h5, but that looks really ugly. Yeah, I was expecting h5, and then I was seriously considering de anyway. So bishop e5. And actually, you might also have like knight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe knight e5 first and then bishop e7. Yeah, or but I think this also helps create the threat of knight b6. So I was more enticed by that. But yeah, knight e5 and bishop a7 also looks great. I mean, a pawn is a pawn, and you know you're still super tied down. Yeah, and and again, two bishops versus two knights. That's that's also really uh, really really annoying to play. Yeah, in such a position, agreed. People uh, resting for us says King B8 was necessary at some point after castles, but I don't think you had a chance to play it. Like yeah, every... I just didn't have time. I think you played really well with uh, with initiative. I think that's that's a very good game to uh, to show to people to understand like the power of the initiative, not giving opponent time to consolidate. Yeah, I appreciate that. Uh, you defended like a monster, though. After after I won the exchange, I kind of thought it was over. Uh, bishop h2 is a really nice move. I'll just show that queen takes h2 is terrible because there's no longer the pin on the knight, and now knight c5 is possible. So at least you get a pawn. Yeah. And I think a lot of people in this position would have just sort of taken on e5 and kind of relaxed, but if you can move your king and go knight c5, you're super solid in the center. I assume you were kind of hoping for something like that. Yeah, I, I think that's not so easy to win, actually. Like, maybe for you it's so easy, but uh, in general, I have some practical chances because e4 is an isolated pawn as well. Maybe I can pressure it with getting the other knight to d6, if, if given time, of course. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and if I, if I can get pawns on the dark squares, for instance, because you have just one dark light squared bishop, maybe I can get some sort of blockade and safety, but yeah, the dream is g5, h5, h4. No, but it's it's definitely not easy. The other thing, I mean, I was very tempted to take, but there's here there's this, yeah, 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 such a nice move. And rook h8 is such a big, I mean, I guess I have to play rook h3 and I'm still winning, yeah, but, but you're kind of tied down now, maybe, maybe. F no F five doesn't work. Maybe B five. I I wasn't considering <laughs> going B five, but it looks interesting. Like I kept seeing these nightmare scenarios. Like let's say takes takes Bishop B two, then maybe G five Knight G six. It's definitely lost. It's probably completely lost, according to the engine. But practically, it's not so simple in such positions. I mean, this knight is a monster. Yeah, surely. But but you can you can always go Queen G seven as well if. 
There's True. something happening on the H file. We can go queen g7. Plus, it it hits the pawn. No, I think queen h7 is a viable alternative. But once I saw queen e6, I couldn't pull my eyes away from it. Yeah. Um. So rook e8 is forced. If you had gone king d8, I think I can play rook d1, creating just a massive pressure on the knight. Yeah. And then drop the bishop back. Doesn't seem right to me. No, I think rook e8 is the best chance. And then I. I saw rook f6, knight d6, and rook f6, and I just figured this has to be winning. Mm -hmm. um, if knight f6, there's mate in one. Yeah, of course. So rook f8 is forced. What were your thoughts in this position? Were you still hoping to pull it out? Um, I mean, if I was, honestly, if I was playing against someone low rated, surely, <laughs> but. Uh... I, I thought like at least I don't see uh, I don't see the win right away. That's the point. Like j just to give a give you a story that uh, for the viewers if if they like to. I I recently had a game where I played against somebody much lower rated than myself, and I was getting mated in a situation like this. Mm -hmm. So what I did was that. I was trying to play the moves which the refutation seemed the most difficult for myself to find. Like I was refuting all the moves and the one that looked the, the least clear, I was playing that. And I just kept fighting, kept hanging on until opponent made a blunder and I won the game. Yeah, but, that's uh, that's sure. so true. Like people get flustered when they don't see like a forced win and they think a forced win has to exist. Kind of like this position. I was definitely getting flustered. I see. Um, okay, I cheated a little bit. There is a f immediate win, which I totally missed. It's rook f8, knight f8. And it's so funny. I was only like considering the f7 square, but queen f6 is, just ends the game. Wow. So it's knight e7, queen h8, and you win a knight. I guess, oh. wait, but what if, what if king d7? I guess just e5 is overwhelming. e5, knight e6, and what now? Bishop c4 probably. Oh shoot, I see a cool line. Bishop c4, knight c5, e6, and mate on oh, f4. I, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's going to be all sorts of lines like this in the oh, end of the game. Oh, it's actually mate, Jesus. <laughs> yeah, it doesn't even win the queen, it's just mate. For, for a second, I thought you were just winning the queen, then I realized it's mate. I thought so too. I think this is all four. So bishop c4, can you not move the knight? I guess you can go knight d5, but then I... I mean, at a minimum, Maybe just... Queen or queen, immediate queen f7 just made in two. Sure. The queen e8 is made. So this is... This was the forced win. Yeah, I missed queen f6. Um, I missed queen f6. I also and didn't so, see that. So I decided, that, like, the best bet is just to keep the rooks on the board and keep knight d6 alive. It really hurts you that you can't move your knight because of knight d6 and rook f8. Yeah, exactly. That's why I played rook g8. That was the only thing that came to my mind, just preparing some knight c5 maybe. Yeah, that's... I actually panicked a little bit when I saw... Like, knight c5 is a very strong threat. As soon as I made a move, I realized that... Wait, no, bishop c4 is still knight c5. So I think b4 oh, I is very annoying. For, like, I was hoping for knight d6, king d8, rook f7, knight c5, where, again, I... Maybe probably there's some win, but I I just couldn't see it for white. Yeah, no, here it gets very complicated, I think. I almost went for I don't know what I I almost went for some line. Like bishop c4 looked so tempting to me to create the x-ray, but here again knight c5. Knight d6, king d8, and it's kind of a dead end. Although there's a crazy move. Knight takes b7 here. <laughs> wow. Oh my no, god, I, what a move. None of these occur to me, but uh, I, I was 100% sure I'm completely lost, but I was just trying to play the moves which uh, I didn't see the instant refutation to them. Yeah, you did an amazing job of that. Like before rook g7, again, I, I think I have to play like a slow move, like e5. And at this point, I mean, I'm just closing in on you. I, it's just too cramped. But queen b6 yeah, is another move. really good move. So here I almost went knight d6 and rook f7. And my thought was that I'm threatening queen e8 and queen c8 mate. But then I realized the knight controls that square and you have time for queen e3. 
Wow, it's actually a draw. Yeah, like queen e8, queen e7. I guess you can just you have it's maybe perpetual, time? or or like queen c1, queen h6. Yeah, this looks like a perpetual. Here, queen here. G1, queen e3. Incredible. So, so, so we sometimes even can save games against uh, strong players from these hopeless positions. Yeah, it's like the Magnus, you know, one survive one more move. A5 was another nice move. Um, but I think BA just puts too much strain on your position. Yeah, I was desperately trying for some counterplay, but it was non-existent. Yeah, if takes, then knight d6, and knight b7 is a fork. That was the idea. Queen b1, rook f1. Yeah, I think... Maybe maybe your last, like, many chances to play queen c2 to stop rook d1. I see. But here I was planning knight d6 and knight takes b7, simply. I mean, I'm also up, like, a million pawns at this point. Yeah, like... Even if you trade everything, you're gonna win pretty easily. I think maybe like I, I I'm also cheating a little bit. Uh, after rook yeah. f1, maybe, maybe queen takes f1 is the best chance. Yeah, I, at first I almost didn't play rook f1 because of it, but then I thought rook f7. Oh, I miss. I thought bishop c4 just ends the game, but I guess you have rook f5 and rook takes c5, and suddenly you're back in the game. This should be a technical win, but. Uh... It asks some questions for sure. Yeah, I wonder what the eval is here. It's plus uh, queen d6 I have to find. Rook e5 and bishop e6. Yeah, here uh, here you have to give the rook away. Yeah, so, that should be pretty easy. Bishop c4. The top engine was rook f4, actually. <laughs> it's hard to play rook f4 when you have rook f5, but... Yeah, yeah. now... Bishop back. Okay, yeah, T definitely technical win, but maybe could have stayed in the game a little bit longer. Yeah, I I, I didn't fancy my chances in that in, <laughs> a, a, against someone like you for sure. <laughs> well, I mean, the way you held on, you definitely put some doubt in my mind. Okay, yeah, here obviously it's over. So I wonder like where where your like big mistake was because it just seemed like once you had castled queenside, it was already unpleasant. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, so personally, honestly, I don't know. Like, it just felt like I slowly got got outplayed. Maybe, maybe the whole idea with castling queenside in this line is not great. Like, it wasn't one move. I think that just completely changed the eval or something. Mm -hmm. Agreed completely. I I actually think maybe bishop takes f three was the start of your troubles. Because somehow yeah, the light sure. the light squares was always like a, a hidden enemy for you. I wonder what the what the theory is. Okay, yeah, bishop d6 is the theory move. And then if knight h4, the engine recommends ah, bishop g6 here. Just to stop knight f5. Yeah. And in the event of a trade, you get the h file. So now you get play against the h2 pawn. Here white is worse. Yeah, sure, but you're never going to take that. Oh, yeah, yeah no, I, I I would probably play knight f5. Yeah, I was worried about knight f5, bishop g5, and just seemed really, really uh, practically hard to play this, this, this position. But already here you can play ed, cd, and queen b6. So here you're yeah, starting to queen... hit all my pawns. But knight, oh, knight takes e4. e4. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. Queen F2, knight. I think here white is already in trouble all of a sudden. So probably I shouldn't go knight F5. Probably I should go like knight D2 or something. But obviously if, if you can make me play knight D2 before developing the bishop, I think you're okay to just castle. Yeah. So. But after castles, you might actually take on G6 and play Ooh. knight F3. Yep, that's kind of what I, my intuition says as well. I think white's slightly better in all these positions, but probably like... My chat is also saying queen c7 on move 11 wasn't ideal. Okay, so as you said, like maybe the castle's queenside idea. Maybe just castle kingside. 
Maybe yeah, I, the simplest approach is best. I actually, honestly, I play, like I played a lot online, and I, I faced literally every line, every line against Caro like more than twenty times, and I mm -hmm. usually castle king side in fantasy, but for some reason. In a longer time control game, I was scared. I was like, I'm gonna get pressed on the king side. Knight d2, queen g3, rook f1. Like this, this all seemed really scary. All these pieces coming. Yeah, queen h4, of course. Queen g3. There's some ed4. Um, yeah, I... and I, that was like a game time decision to try long castling for the first time in my life. Yeah, it's a really interesting plan. I think the only reason black is okay here is because of this idea. Takes takes and queen b6. And somehow black holds on by a thread. Because e5, queen d4 doesn't work. You take on e5. And I think black gets enough counterplay here. Yeah. Like, fantasy is really concrete. You can't just play by intuition most of the time. Yeah, it is. It is. It's such a, it's such a rich variation. Uh, but it was such a fun game. Like once you castled queenside, it was a it was a rich position, and I thought you defended uh, really, really resiliently. Yeah, I'm usually so. known to be a resilient defender in my games. Uh, and what what I really what I'm really lacking in my game, and I really like to learn better, is what you did in the game perfectly, like playing with initiative, not giving time for opponents to consolidate. Yeah. And I think that was a very instructive game for me as well to face. I appreciate that. This, yeah, this was a lot of fun to play. Um, I was fully focused, probably more so than any other speedrun game. So thank you for, thank you for that experience. I, I really appreciate it. Of course, you're welcome. And uh, it was a great experience for me as well. I nice glad to you stream, talk to people. Of course, I'll give you another shout out. I'll let you go. But uh, thank you, Kusha. Thank you for uh, for analyzing with me. Sure, you're always welcome. Have a great one, Danya. You too. See you soon again. Bye. Bye. All right. I hope you guys enjoyed. That's sort of what you know analysis looks like at a high level. I know that it was fast paced for some people. So what I'm going to do is go through a couple of the key moments again more slowly and just draw some conclusions because. I know that was a little bit all over the place, but th again, like that is what analysis is like. Uh, you just sort of jump around from moment to moment. Okay, here I thought this, I thought that, the engine thinks this. Um, and at the end of the day, you just form a better understanding of what your opponent was thinking. Um, so for those watching on YouTube, that was my opponent. Uh, very graciously volunteered to call and analyze. Thanks again. So let's... Uh, hit on the main points of this game. So I played the fantasy. Gusha responded with sort of one of the main lines, this bishop g4 variation. Um, bishop c4 is the main move. And then sort of the battle started revolving around the center. Now, knight d7 here is important. If black starts with knight f6, then there's the bishop takes f7 tactic. Knight e5, and the knight returns to take on g4. Um... So this is theory, castles, knight f6, c3, and bishop h5 to protect the f7 pawn. And here I came up with this very interesting idea that set everything in motion. Queen e1, in order to free the knight, bishop f3, rook f3. And we have determined, I think, that the actual main mistake was the plan with long castles. Like, why was long castles conceptually the wrong plan? I think what it has to do with is the fact that black's kingside pawns are actually weaker than they look. The f7 pawn is weak, the g7 pawn is going to be weak, and even though the king is going to be safe, the kingside is going to be on fire. So I think what we both underestimated was this idea of ed, cd, and queen b6 attacking the center and giving black just enough counterplay, according to the engine, uh, to keep the balance. Okay, the line here is rook d3, rook eight, okay, h6 now. So this gets really, really sharp, takes, takes, e5, rook e8 to pin the pawn. And my gut is that white is still better here, but probably this was a better practical chance than queen c7. And I think the idea that I'm happiest with, that I'm most proud of, is this bishop d3 move. This, I think, was a really, really strong idea because it does everything at once. It solidifies the center, 
it puts pressure on black center and it gives us the possibility of taking the bishop and getting two bishops against two knights, which in an open board is usually really bad for the two knights, and this is no exception. Um, and then the next stage of the game was all about provoking weaknesses on the king side and putting the queen on h3, another very important ingredient, x-raying the knight and creating d takes e5 threats. Perhaps king b8 here was a more resilient move, but then we would have taken on h7, and that's a free pawn. So just uh, already a very bad position for black, but huge kudos to Kusha for defending super well after giving up the exchange. I think a lot of people would just like instantly collapse, but he found all of the best chances. I found this rook f6, knight d6, rook f6 idea, which essentially was the game winning idea. Um, yeah, provoking weaknesses on the side opposite where the king is is good too. That's a good takeaway from this game, right? You, you can win chess games by attacking the side of the board that doesn't have your opponent's king. That's totally valid. In fact, most of the game was won on the king side. Ultimately, I was able to attack the king in the center, but it was because I provoked all of the... The dam really broke on the f-file and on the king side. Uh, and, okay, I missed a forced win here with the rook f8 and, knight, and queen f6. But I think what I did was good enough. I think this is still completely winning. Um, according to the computer, rook takes f7 and queen e5 offered the most chances. But obviously, this just means playing down a full exchange. Rook f8 check is strong. Knight is overloaded. Okay, this is obviously winning for white, just a full extra exchange. Uh, so I, I really think I never truly left it, uh, let it off the hook. And after the rook f3, it's already totally winning. Okay, um, to, before I conclude, I'll check the accuracy because I'm getting requests to do that. All right, 89.5 to 80.4. So pretty high level game. Um, not without mistakes though, obviously. There was one question, what about queen g3 instead of bishop g5? So queen g3 here, I think black can simply castle. Yeah, and if you play bishop h6, then the knight can drop back to e8. I don't think this is the end of the world because e takes d4 is now a big threat. A queen on g3 is actually quite misplaced uh, if the bishop on d6 is not under fire. In the game, there was a knight on c4 that was attacking that bishop, so it was safe to put the queen on g3. But here, I think queen g3, black can castle. Black does not have to play knight h5. Actually, knight h5 is a huge blunder because the bishop takes f7. So, anyways, hope you enjoyed the game, guys. Thank you, Takusha, once again. This will be up on YouTube. And I will head on out. Thank you, everybody, for watching. And uh, I'll see you tomorrow. Bye.